of some uh, activities that happened of late on the administration side. Um, as we've been moving through this process, uh, eventually, because we're talking about state funds being spent, the state and Department of Revenue and ANF were like, well, tell us more about this project. Uh, I think we have to appreciate that this is, even though the governor just celebrated his first year, the team is still new, and it takes a long time to catch up with all the projects and to understand everything that's going on. So um, I was asked to go in and brief uh, ANF, uh, Administration of Finance, and Department of Revenue about the Mass Broadband Initiative, what's going on. Obviously, early in the administration, the governor had approved the funds for the last mile. Um, but as we go through this, they wanted updates, et cetera. And so uh, what's resulted from that is um, we are going to be doing a briefing very soon. Those of you who are here representing our elected officials, we're scheduling, I believe, for next week, uh, a briefing for our delegation that are in the towns represented um, in the Last Mile Project um, so that we can just update where we are. And we are working very closely with the MBI staff, myself, and Department of Revenue and ANF um, to make sure that there is agreement on, let's say, the parameters of which the funds are spent and the business plans are approved of. And so the administration just wants to make sure that um, any expenditures that do happen, not only are within the approval realm of what MBI is approving of with its team, um, but that the administration also is in agreement. Obviously, DOR has the best interest of the communities and their revenues uh, at heart. And so they're very diligently reviewing all the different numbers, all of the different business plans, just wanting to make sure that whatever communities are committing to is sustainable for the long run. So we've been asked to just pause, uh, I would say is the best way to describe it, pause a little bit so that we have time to really work clearly with ANF and DOR so that we can answer all of their questions and make sure that we're all on the same page as we move forward. It is to just let everyone know that uh, and I'm, I'm not, maybe everyone already knows this, but as we do request expenditure of state funds, it's not only an approval process by the board and what's happening here, but it is an approval process by uh, the administration as well. Uh, and I think that that's important to note. So that's where we are, making sure that we're all on the same page currently, okay? All right, any questions from the board about that? All right, okay, great, thank you. Right, so our next item is a report of the Massachusetts Broadband Institute Director, which we, Eric. Great, go for it. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, 
what some of the things we're going to get into as updates I'd like to do um, through the presentation that also leads us into a conversation about um, sustainability and operating sustainability, which, um, as the chair just pointed out, has been a significant topic of interest um, for members of the administration in addition to the three sevens that we've been meeting with. Uh, it's also something we've been talking a lot about over the last year with towns and amongst ourselves with our, with our staff, and we thought, frankly, as we get into, uh, into this presentation and discussion, some things that Michael Burgess is going to talk about, um, this isn't intended to be a conversation with the board that's conclusory. It's tended to be something that we can share good information, uh, get good topics on the, on the table, and use this, hopefully, this conversation as a platform for um, work we're going to need to be doing over the course of the year and really the course of the project. Um, as an update, since the last time we met, um, not much news, right? Um, the, uh, we were, uh, you know, in, in a pretty significant uh, public conversation with uh, the, the cooperative organization Wired West. Um, I'm pleased to update with the board that since that time we've sat down and met with Wired West uh, a, a number of times, I think at least six times, six or seven times, uh, in including uh, uh, engaging a, a newly appointed uh, negotiating or representative team from Wired West, uh, which includes a number of members of Wired West. Um, we've also focused our discussion on areas that, as you may recall, were um, significant points of discussion around the governance model uh, adopted or proposed by Wired West, as well as also the business plan. And so um, in addition to some of the things that we're going to talk to in a second, which is really going to be the focus of our meeting, I just wanted to update with you that I've, I've found and hopefully my, the team, my colleagues, have found our, uh, our engagement, our conversations, and our work uh, to uh, share information, share perspectives, and, uh, and focus <coughs> those conversations to be uh, as productive as we think the board, and as helpful as we think the board had encouraged us to do uh, in the last meeting. So with, with that, as I said, it's not really the focus of our meeting. We communicated with Wired West also. We really wanted to talk about other issues that, frankly, we weren't able to engage in last time. And I think, frankly, a lot of the issues we're raising today are germane, whether you're talking about an individual town, uh, a collective of towns, or any number of circumstances. And some of the updates here actually include updates on what we're doing. So I wanted to update with you on, on uh, our broadband extensions program, which we've often called partial cable. Um, get into some updates on, on last mile that also members of our team will <coughs> be discussing as well. Then get into our presentation and then on, on uh, sustainability <coughs> issues. And then uh, if time permits, get into the network operations, so an update on the sales and performance of the network, which hopefully we'll be able to get to. And if you if your perspective, I'll <coughs> Uh, so just as a, as, a, as a level set again, just to remind people, uh, the towns in, in blue here are the uh, so-called partial cable, or the towns that have cable franchise agreements um, that have substantial gaps in coverage. Uh, the green are towns that are entirely unserved. Um, on broadband extensions, uh, is, I'm going to try to bring you straight up to the, to the present day on where we are with this uh, project. Uh, I know it's been a source of some concern about how long it's taken uh, to move through some of the steps around uh, uh, qualifying firms and identifying uh, our path forward. But as you may recall, we did an RFQ last summer uh, looking for potential providers who'd be interested in uh, doing extensions in these towns. Uh, we did get two responses back, one from Comcast and one from uh, Matrix. And, uh, and we had additional, the working group that we have together within MBI and Mass Tech had identified a series of questions that we wanted to get additional information, but also some information that we thought would be very important to share with the towns, including uh, proposed coverage maps and information uh, and, and other things. And uh, we sent that information uh, out, right, that request, out right before uh, Christmas, as you can see, at 1224. Uh, we got a response back from Comcast on January 15th from Matrix just this past Friday. Uh, the, 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 the next step for us, and we're currently doing this now, is to uh, schedule meetings. We have meetings scheduled, I think, on February 3rd, as well as February 9th, uh, with, a, with a, a number of the towns. Uh, and we're, we're trying to get all the towns set up so that we can go meet with them, share what we have up to date. As a matter of fact, as, I think as soon as today, we're going to email 
uh, the response information we got out to the town so that they have plenty of time to pour over the maps, prepare uh, what their thoughts are in terms of the proposed coverage and information. Um, we also anticipate, um, as I just discussed a moment ago, with Matrix, we anticipate getting some additional information from Matrix as well, a um, map as well as some information on, on their business plan as well, which will be very helpful to our evaluation. We anticipate getting that soon, very soon. Uh, so uh, it is our hope that, that what we can do with the towns is get as much information back from them that can inform uh, negotiations that can, can lead hopefully to a uh, successful inclusion of agreements and a presentation of those recommendations. First, obviously, to the executive team at Mass Tech, um, but also then subsequently to the boards of MBI and, and Mass Tech. But also, this is one of those things that, as I discussed earlier, um, the, the administration, and we're really grateful for this, is digging in now on understanding what we're doing, um, how it'll work, how the towns will benefit, and how we ensure sustainability over time. I think that's a fair thing to say. Yep. So any, any questions on Could this? Could you characterize the quality of the response? Uh, well, I mean, as we as we had qualified them, both, all the responses we got uh, extended coverage to the program target goal of the regional average of 96% coverage. Yep. Um, the uh, where some of the information we're waiting to get back, I think, would help inform our understanding of uh, the sustainability organizational structure and, and the business plans that are being presented. So, at this point, I think what we can say is. We have proposals on the table that meet the program goals for the towns. Um, some of them, I think, were really even a little surprising in that regard in terms of what some of it included. And we're really looking, the next thing we're looking to do is sit down with the select people in the, in the broadway committees of the towns, share it with them, get their feedback. So it's, it's a little preliminary to get into, into that. Anything else? Okay. I'm just loving the PowerPoint and all the graphics with every slide. Is this Katie? Is Katie yeah. Stoico here? Yeah. Yes, she is. She's That's uh, nice. Good job. And she also improves all the content, by the way. She's a wicked good editor as well. So she's not just a pretty graphic. She's actually a, just a, a profoundly uh, terrific person. Um, I had the org chart. There'd be a little star next to Katie Stoico. Uh, uh, but speaking of people who are wonderful, uh, I don't know if Elizabeth or Dave wants to say anything about this slide. What you introduce? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Would you like me to review it? I yes! Think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Saying something about it and reviewing it doesn't mean it's nice. Um, on the full collection RFQ and mini bid process, we've talked about this uh, on other, in other occasions and other meetings. Um, basically, where we would hire and select a firm to go out and survey the polls as required by Verizon Grid and, and Eversource. So we completed the process where we uh, put out an RFQ request for Qualifications to, you know, out as a as a uh, an RFQ received five firms that uh, responded to the RFQ. We qualified four out of those five firms, and we basically went through a process of then getting that, them our M MSAs. So those out of those uh, four out of the five firms, three executed uh, fully executed MSAs, and one vendor went through uh, just recently. So on the we would then turn this RFQ into a mini bid process, depending on how we move forward with the overall project. And the mini bid would go out to specific towns and engage one of these firms to um, to do the work for us. So while I'm still talking, <laughs> on the design engineer RFP, in a similar fashion, uh, we drafted an RFP um, as we were working with the administration. Uh, also asked to redirect to the towns to get their input into this RFP. Um, the design engineering RFP is a very extensive document um, that breaks down uh, kind of two phases, uh, kind of a, a development phase where we uh, kind of script out for the vendor that's selected what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish here, um, and they tell us what their best practices would be to, to develop a, a strategy around uh, building a, a communications network via wireless or, or wireline uh, fiber system. Um, the second phase of the project would really be execution of the engineer, um, really to design the, the network out across the 44 communities. Um, we had sent out an RFP extract that was released to the towns on 
uh, right before uh, the holiday break. Um, we received comments from 17 out of 44 communities, over 30 to 39% of the communities responded. 168 questions in total. Uh, Charlemont uh, uh, had a actually asked 82 of those questions of the 168. So we have the winner, you're saying. We have the winner. <laughs> we have the winner. <laughs> we win the prizes. Bob and Charlie, you guys win. Um, so um, the deadline uh, was actually, we extended this deadline based on some feedback that we received from the communities. I think rightfully so with the holiday break and everything. We extended that by two weeks and that will close at the end of this month on 129. Uh, we'll then review those questions internally and, and determine how we respond in kind. Um, the final RFP, <coughs> RFP uh, release date has not been determined, again, based on direction uh, that we'll take from the administration. But I, I would add to the comment about the, the, the review process. Um, we're going to post all of the comments and questions we got and then um, provide answers to the questions as well. Also, pu also publicly, to the extent that some of the questions are very similar, we may group the questions and answer them in common. Um, but, uh, so there may be some organization with the questions in that regard. But just to be clear, we're going to be fully transparent with the feedback we got, as well as obviously people will be aware of any, any changes we make to the RFP in response to those, that feedback as well. So uh, the, the really, this, this and the next slide are going to be uh, very similar to what we've seen before. And, uh, and what I, uh, snow and icicles, if you, if you can quite see it. Um, <laughs> and uh, really what this is, is again, uh, an articulation of what steps have been taken in terms of either votes or planned votes by the towns. It's not really an expression of anything else in terms of where a town is, in terms of its organization. but. I think what it what it tells you is is uh, this and the next slide tells you two things. Uh, one, it tells you that there are a heck of a lot of towns that have taken significant uh, political actions locally um, to organize themselves uh, or aggregate opinion and demand and take votes, and that those votes also constitute a very significant proportion of uh, of uh, our allocated funds in terms of the board actions here. Um, as well as a number of the towns, but in fact there's also still a pretty strong stratification of, of towns, some of which have moved forward, some of which haven't, some which in fact have never engaged us at all in any way on the project. And so you've seen this before, it hasn't changed in the last couple months, and that's really the intent of showing it to you again, is to show that from a pure statement of where towns are with their votes, there's really a diversity of places they are, but a number of towns that have done very significant votes and actions. We, as you know before, we've been providing uh, planning grant funds uh, to towns. I don't know if you have anything you want to update on that or I can just talk through. Yeah, go ahead. That the, uh, there, we continue to get some towns coming to us, as you can see here with Tierringham and a little while ago Otis, uh, coming forward with uh, proposals for planning grants to support work in these towns. I think one of the things I would, I would point out, uh, which is going to be echoed in the next slide and is going to lead into some of the conversation we're having, is that there, there are, there are, there's still a process of sorting itself out in terms of where towns are in terms of their thinking. So just as an example, uh, Tiringham has been uh, very interested in understanding whether they could uh, engage a private sector company to come in, provide some sort of long-term uh, financing in exchange for operating uh, in their town in an exclusive license or, or right that would then reduce their borrowing costs very substantially. Uh, the town of Otis, uh, which isn't shown here, uh, had wanted to just get a better handle on what it would look like to set up their MLP and run it if they were looking to do that. And so they were interested in engaging an entity called Whip City, which is out of Westfield, municipal light plant there, to try to understand that as well. But as you can also see, Mount Washington, which recently had uh, a bill passed, a home rule petition passed to the legislature, uh, that's sitting, I think, on the governor's desk, that as, as it stands would enable them to uh, execute all essentially of the rights of an MLP without actually forming an MLP. They could borrow and, and deploy broadband within their community uh, and essentially on their own. And, and, and Matt Washington, very similar to uh, Princeton, has taken a, a sort of go it alone approach that is um, I, mean this, I mean this in a kind way, I don't mean it disrespectfully, but like an extreme going it alone. Like they're actually literally saying, 
I don't want anyone particularly to help me or bother me. I just want to go out and do it myself without any help from MBI or Wirebest or anyone else. And they certainly have the right to do that or uh, if they can prove that they're going to be sustainable and that they have the funds and they can engage the private sector. But the point I'm making here is that as we've gotten these grants in, we've gotten a very strong block of towns, obviously, as you can see, that are organized in a, as, as members of Wired West. We've also gotten other towns that are looking at different technologies, different approaches, and are really sorting through what they're doing. That's similarly echoed in this slide, where again, I'm really, I'm not stating that this is the, the, the God's truth or anything, but it's just based on the conversations and feedback we've gotten, we've just gotten, you know, some towns that uh, may still go with Wired West in the, in the end, as I remember meeting with Colerain a couple months ago, they said they may very well want Wired West as an operator, but they just simply were sorting through their options and they weren't sure. In the same way that I heard the same thing from Asheville at one point. But there are also many towns that are with Wired West. Some towns are doing nothing. Some towns that are looking for private sector builds. Uh, and, uh, and so that what that means for us here, I think, and also there are wireless ones too. If you look at the four uh, towns up there, there are four towns in sort of yellow, yellowish color that are actively engaged in one way or another in a feasibility study or pilot project around a wireless deployment in their communities. And um, in, in often case, those, those towns correspond with towns that would otherwise be high cost towns to do a full fiber to the home deployment. Uh, as we'd estimated. In other cases, uh, such as Warwick, they actually had a legacy, they have an existing uh, legacy wireless uh, service in their town, and they've been very interested in saying if there are ways in which they could modernize it to update it and, and, uh, or replace the existing electronics and make it serviceable to their residents in the future. Um, so it really just suggest, it's suggestive of us of how we need to organize as we move forward to ensure that we're doing the appropriate due diligence and support of, uh, of the range of town options that we think we're likely to see. Um, Shabana or Copeland. Back to me. <laughs> so um, on the Royalston uh, wireless pilot, um, I think um, some great stuff to report well, here. Describe the, describe, just to make sure level set again, people describe the well, problem. I will. Um, so we initially, um, this board approved a $45,000 planning grant for uh, Royalston to perform a wireless pilot, a fixed wireless pilot. So operating at 2.4 gig, uh, 5 gigahertz, and uh, potentially using the TV white space. They didn't use it for this pilot, but they erected two towers. Um, they have, uh, they targeted initially 50 to 60 customers that they wanted to uh, work within what they call this uh, south, southern bowl, uh, a lower spot within uh, the town of Royalston. Um, to date, they've installed 40 customers, um, 12 are pending. Um, They've achieved at least a, a level of broadband service at 25.5, 25.10, John Hardy describes it. Um, but in general, um, the, the project has been very successful and very well received. Um, not without its hiccups as we work through any pilot. Uh, we had some initial issues between their operator and our equipment on the MBI 123 network um, that we've had to work through. But again, this is why we do things like this and pilot them. Um, so as we come out of it, um, John Hardy, is uh, the local gentleman, uh, I think he's the MLP manager. Is he an MLP manager or is he just? Um, he, he's, he's one of these local heroes. He's done a tremendous job of shepherding uh, the ambassador, you name it, uh, you know, running cables, uh, digging ditches. Uh, you, I, I, honestly, I'm not making this stuff up. This guy is a local hero that has really made this project successful. Um, he has brought forward now to us uh, for review uh, much the, the rest of the planning grant, which would uh, provide fixed wireless across a combination kind of a hybrid fixed wireless wired, wired line system with fiber um, across the entire community. Um, so we'll let him get through this pilot. Um, he is working to sign up those customers on one and two year contracts right now. Um, the things they're doing are much different at even a level than what Leverett did and what we've seen out of Leverett where Royalston is actually taking in their town administrative office front-end support for customer calls. They're working all billing issues. And I've, I've cautioned them in a the sense that I'm not sure that's scalable. Um, they're looking at it that they already do those things for their, their residents today with, with uh, tax bills and excise taxes and whatever it may be. So they feel they can handle it. But uh, we'll continue to watch this one because it's interesting. Um, but um, it's so far, so good. Are there any questions about that? It's kind of a real-world thing we're actually doing, so it's kind of 
Please. I have one question. Uh, so sure. you mentioned that they erected two towers yep. and that they are not using the white spectrum from those towers? They're not using TV white space yet. But are they planning on doing that going forward so that the 25, 25 up and 5 down, 5 down or 3 down? It's 5 up. 5 up? 25 but down. down. Okay. Yep. So I got I know. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that um, always so, so that it So that it goes up? I mean, um, well, the, one of the issues road. with TV white space is that right now, with the, the equipment in the TV white space, doesn't operate much higher than 10 meg. Okay. Um, so we're looking at that with them. Um, potentially, that may suffice under Connect America. We got to we got to make some, I think, some policy decisions okay. on, on how they're going to operate that because other communities are looking for similar TV white space usage. So 10 up is not does not sound. It is not as slow as it sounds when compared to kind of cable footprint, et cetera, average, average speeds, et cetera. No, I know. I'm just wondering if more people jump on and if they decide to um, extend the service out to neighboring communities. They're asking the right question because, I mean, that, that's something Eric and I have been discussing. You know, as you look at these communities and they put together their initial plans uh, with their consultants, and as we look at them, you know, we, we ask similar questions and we say, okay, well, if you want to increase that bandwidth, it means erecting more towers, right? Potentially, or, or waiting till the electronics changes out the you know the antennas, the receivers, what that may be, the radios. Um, so it's just it's conversations that we're working through with them, you know, because no one wants to see these towers everywhere. Either, right. right, and plus that should be part of the goal that, that these yeah. communities are assisting each other and helping yep. communities connect that way. So, well, okay. interesting, interestingly enough, just from a sort of a technical support standpoint, I know that Warwick, Boylston, Middlefield, and Holly have all talked a lot with one another to say, you know, and particularly with Royalston having, with Warwick having a legacy system and Royalston having this pilot going, they've been interested in saying, look, you're ahead of us by months. What, what are the issues you're wrestling with? I think the question, one of the questions which I'm, I'm going to punt to the end is, 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 are there ways we should be or can be more systematically supporting uh, towns that are evaluating something other than fiber to the home? I was wondering what was the next slide was. I totally forgot. Um, so, uh, Michael, um, I'm going to hand this over to you. Um, so this this is really, again, as I mentioned, part of the core topic after we went through some of the updates and things we're doing. And I obviously was framing out a little bit sort of the diversity of issues we're dealing with. But we also thought it was useful to dig in on this question of operating sustainability, uh, what we know, what we, what we modeled up to this point. And then, again, I'm going to suggest later that there's probably a lot more work we could be doing, and probably work we need to be doing to support the towns in this regard. Um, but we can talk about that after we have a good conversation. Mike? Sure. Th thank you all for having me back. As, as Eric said, I have just a few slides for you today to talk about our view on operating sustainability, which I'll shortly define in terms of a level of profitability. Um, first, just as a quick status update, um, Wipro has been assisting on several work streams, uh, including identifying differences and similarities and opportunities between Wired West's operating model and Wipro's operating model. I'm not here today to talk at all about Wired West's model. In fact, the model that I'm going to show you is entirely a different approach. The Wired West model is a what I call an in-source build and operate, build and deploy an operator model. Um, what I'm going to show you here is an outsourced model. If you use existing um, existing organizations <coughs> and, and you outsource the functions to them, um, there are there will still need to be more modeling efforts, more analytical efforts to identify uh, which towns as groups could be made sustainable. What I'm going to show you today is individual town analyses. There are some opportunities, there are not a lot of opportunities, but there are some opportunities that when you pool some towns together, there's an increase in sustainability. We haven't done, uh, we haven't run that to ground yet. Um, and there are towns that are unlikely, you'll see today, in our opinion, that are unlikely to be sustainable with a fiber to the home model of almost any kind. Um, and we can talk about that also. Um, We've also, I'll, I'll take it off the table because I'm not going to talk about it today, but you know, we've also been involved in uh, some of the partial cable things with, with Matrix and Comcast. So 
I mean, before I, before I get everybody's eyes crossing, th this is a really tough question to crack operating sustainability because there are literally a hundred, at least a hundred operating decisions that this board's going to make, the state's going to make, the organization operating in these towns are going to make, the towns themselves are going to make in collaboration, in isolation, etc. You put all those decisions together and the entity that is serving looks very different. So I already took one off the table. Ice. For example, you could have an entirely insourced operation with a call center, with trucks, with techs, with salespeople, or you can break all of that apart and farm it out to existing operations. Right? That's just one decision. And when you break that decision apart, well, do you keep the call center inside or the call center outside? The salespeople inside or the salespeople outside? So you can just keep unpeeling that. Um, and I'll go through some of the bigger decisions that have guided this analysis that the board instructed MBI and me over a year ago that I want to talk about where there might be flexibility or what those decisions, what the impact of those decisions is today. That said, I'm going to give you two scenarios so you can get your head around what it means to the town. So the first one is let's not include debt service in the operations. Let's not include the cost of running the MLP in the operations. Still would need to be borne by the town, right? Both debt service and MLP operation. Um, let's not include the cost of any town, any other town administrative functions. That's just on the town. Let's think about fully outsourcing. And let's think about what a what I would counsel you a sustainable, typical rural broadband price is in other communities. Go ahead. I, I just want to interject just for a point of clarity. I think people understand this, but if not, I want to be abundantly clear. When you say let's not for the sake of something, you're not making a recommendation. You're saying, hey, I've done this modeling analysis to understand what the pressures are on sustainability. And for the sake of argument, Absolutely. I have not included these things. You're not saying you shouldn't or should. That will be for another conversation or something a like that. Absolutely. I'm just, I'm just defining that. the inputs Good. so that I can give you right. a, a factual output. Exactly. Right? So there's no commentary or critique on any of these decision points. Okay? And again, I started with let's presume, and this is an important nuance that I, that I haven't raised to this board before. You've heard me say that regionality, that scale, is the only way to keep costs down sufficiently enough to operate. I want to pose that you can do that in two different ways. You can do that by having a broad enough organization, a large enough customer base in Western Massachusetts. You can do that with tying up with organizations that have customers elsewhere that still get that scale benefit. So, you get a benefit in billing when you're billing a lot of customers. Whether they're all in Western Massachusetts or they're all, all, all over the world, that IT system that you put in to do that billing is now, you're, you're amortizing across all of your customers. So we've done this as an outsource model, again, without commentary as to how you achieve that outsource. Okay, and what it says, and, and again, I'm, I'm gonna put up some, some numbers here, or suggest some numbers. I'm not saying these are the number, these, this is the, an answer. I'm saying this is a way to get you thinking about what, what the options are. When we, given all of those assumptions, when we look at town by town operating cash flow, we find that there's a few towns, four of them, that generate more than $100,000 in cash flow, in pot, in net cash flow every year at a 50% take rate. Why is, it, why is that important? Again, the number 100,000 isn't important, it's just a nice round number, but it's important that towns generate some amount of free cash so that they can deal with some amount of unforeseen circumstances, right? Something breaks, the operator's gotta pay for it out of free cash flow. Fiber run breaks, a truck breaks down, there's a big ice storm, et cetera. How much? I'm not telling you how much you need to save, I'm just saying 100 is an easy, an easy number. Similarly, there are more than a dozen towns that generate less than $25,000 in free cash flow at a 50% pay rate. Less than 25K and negative, right? And less than zero. I just lumped that all together because, in our view, that's insufficient to deal with, you know, to deal with uh, 
unforeseen circumstances. Now this is at a 50% penetration, and again, at the risk of, I don't want to bias the conversation, so at a 75% penetration, it looks much better. I'll tell you, in Wipro's opinion, this is the maximum level of penetration that could possibly be you know, reasonably expected. It doesn't mean that a town won't get to 90. It doesn't mean that a town won't get to, you know, a few towns won't get to 80, et cetera. It means that when you look at the fact that there are houses that are unoccupied, there's very few of them, that there are homes that are seasonal and aren't going to take service all year round, there are people that are not going to sign up for these services because they don't want them, and you start taking those out, Maximum penetration rates that we see, expect, believe in uh, are around 75%, right? So when this board has said, you know, what's a base case, what's a downside, what's an upside, and at the risk of, I'm only speaking for myself and my professional opinion, I would tell you, you should expect the base case should be in the 60% range, but you should plan for 40% so that the whole thing doesn't fail you hit 40%, right? Um, but again, I'm giving you nice easy round numbers. At 75%, about 50-ish uh, percent, 40% of, of 20, I think it's 23 towns, um, hit that $100,000 mark, right? That said, there are still eight-ish towns that don't. So why is this important? These eight towns need something else. Whatever you believe about all of these other towns, these eight towns, everybody, I think, everybody will agree that these eight towns need, need us to figure out an alternative solution, construct, et cetera. Pat, for a second, as a practical real world example, people may recall that I ended up, uh, really a, a pleasure, going around and meeting with 33, 34 towns or something like that over the summer and the fall. Um, and depending on, every, everyone obviously would appreciate if there is I don't know, more state money into the project and could, could defray more, more of the cost. Um, some towns were more vocal about the stress that they felt they were under, either from a borrowing perspective or their concern about making it work. Um, no town was more vocal about that than the town of Hawley. And, uh, and it, it was, uh, I don't know how to put it, but I mean, when we were looking independently at questions of borrowing capacity, and questions of sustained operating sustainability, it was interesting to me how well Holly knew itself, that it's a town that actually genuinely is under is under is under significant constraints from an operating and sustainability perspective. That may not be true from the perspective of some of the other towns you've identified, Michael, in terms of the conversation with them or where they are. But it, it it's a, it makes me happy anyways that as a as a board even so far, as an organization so far, we've embraced trying to figure out how to help a town like Holly because they, they need to look at alternatives. So not speaking even for the others. So, so to be clear, from my perspective, Eric showed you the stoplight slide a little while ago that talked about which towns had voted to authorize <coughs> borrowing, right? There's a two by two matrix, I'm not consulting, right? So there's a two by two matrix here that says, can you operate sustainably and can you borrow? Right? And the way that I've, the way that we've done this particular model, we've excluded debt service, right? So it really is, you know, mutually exclusive. You need to be in both of those categories. You need to both be able to borrow and fund your debt, and you need to be able to operate sustainably. For, you know, Mitch Tyson asked me last year, you know, which of, you know, under what circumstances are towns going to be in here in two years saying, why isn't this working? How come? So yeah, you have to have both of those. You have to have both of those items. Okay, so I'll get out of the weeds and we'll come up, uh, we'll come up to a strategic level. I thought that it would be useful, actually Eric asked me, so Eric thought that it would be useful, and I agree, <laughs> um, to revisit some of the initial directions that the project was given by this board in collaboration with a lot of the other stakeholders so that you can understand very um, finely how each of those decisions has got us to where we are. And then you can make the decision collectively, independently, whatever, to relax or stand by some of those, some of those initial decisions. So there's a few that I think that are worthy of uh, review at the board level. 
The first one is technology. When we started, when we started this project, or at least when I began, became involved in this project, the towns were saying to MBI very explicitly, they wrote documents that said, we want fiber to the home. Bill got up at meetings and said, towns, you have sent MBI these documents and we've heard you, and if this is what you want, we're prepared to help you. I'll suggest to you now that everybody wants fiber, not everybody is willing to do what is necessary or to deal with the consequences of having fiber. And therefore, there may be opportunities to, let me say it a little bit stronger than that, there are definitely opportunities to help towns that can't go the fiber route with alternative technologies. Right? Some of the other board decisions are going to impact whether or not that's reasonable acceptable. <coughs> One of which is coverage. One of the huge benefits of fiber to any alternative is that for a price, you can connect every home. And they can live at the top of the mountain, at the bottom of the ravine. You're going to pay a lot of money to run fiber up there, but you can get to that house. With, with wireless technologies, it's less certain. That said, you can combine wireless and wireline and you know that house on the top of the mountain, if 100% ubiquitous coverage is is necessary, you could run a fiber route to them and give everybody else wireless. I'm not saying that a policy would make sense, that that policy would make sense. I'm just saying it's possible. But with wireless technologies, you have to consider the ubiquitous requirement that we started with. Um, as the towns are breaking off, at least what I've seen in the press, so I won't speak for anything inform uh, formally, but several of the towns that are breaking off are dealing with this reality of ubiquity or lack of ubiquity. And for the most part, the ones that have fractured from the, the regional model have, or at least you know, as it's been proposed, have been more open to considering you know, non, a non-ubiquitous network. Um, pricing. Originally, one of the directions, and I won't say a requirement like ubiquity and fiber was a requirement. One of the directions was that pricing should be comparable to neighborhood, neighboring competitive markets. So that means that if the town next door has a cable company and they're offering internet at $50 a month, that in our town, when we build something, we should be offering internet at $50 a month. And I will suggest to you that you may want to consider relaxing that as a stipulation of the as a requirement because Comcast in the town next door has properties all over the country and can afford to take a lower margin in its town in western Massachusetts as a result of that. When we build in an unserved town, we don't have the scale to take that, to be able to take a lower margin here and make up for it elsewhere. The only way to make up for those operating costs are to charge consumers more. That doesn't mean $500 for 50 meg broadband packages. But it does mean something above the competitive price in the markets next door. And at, depending on the market, in the 70 to $100 range, more towns start to make sense. More towns start to, especially at higher cover, at higher penetration rates, more towns start to become, you know, break even a profit. Outsourcing. I don't mean outsourcing like send it to send it overseas. I mean outsourcing like use existing companies that handle rural footprints in the United States, whether there are existing companies in Massachusetts, there are not very many of them, or there are existing companies in New York and in Pennsylvania and in New Hampshire that would be willing to come to Massachusetts. There are opportunities to outsource to existing to existing organizations. Debt service. Um, again, I'll speak for Wipro and only you know, for me. Um, there, this is a lot of debt to build, especially if you're still in the fiber world. Um, it's a lot of debt for these towns. Um, and it's a lot of debt to load up onto a consumer bill. So you, and, and you have to think about it like that. The debt has to get paid for via one of two mechanisms. Either the town tax roll and the town funds the debt 
hence every citizen in town is funding the, the bill, or it gets burdened onto the consumer. And again, there's no, uh, no commentary on a preference. I'm just saying it has to come from one place or the other. So either it's gonna go into the pricing and the consumers are gonna pay for it, or it's gonna go into the taxes and the town's gonna pay for it. Um, if you put it in the price, then you can charge it to the operator. If you're not gonna put it in the price, you can't charge it to the operator. Um, and then finally, MLP costs. MLP costs on a dollar base, on a, kind of the amount of dollars involved in this are not very high, especially relative to all of the other big categories of costs. But there is a huge burden of organization, of, of education, of learning, of outreach to the towns to help them build these organizations, operate these organizations. Um, and where, do, where does that get funded from? organized by, et cetera, it's, it's, another, uh, it's another question. Some of those costs can get pushed to the operator if you so choose. You could choose to have the operators collect um, fiber plant replacement funds and build a fund so that when things break, the operator, the operator replace it. Or you can choose to have a lower price from the operator and the town could create that fund. These were all decisions that were made, some of them very intentionally, collectively, some of them because of where we were pushed given what the towns were saying or other actors were, were requesting, that, that I would suggest the board needs to think about um, if, if you still stand by, if you still want the same decisions that had been made last year to be the only decisions guiding you know, the future of the project. So what does it mean? I'll give you some some, you know, both sides of, uh, of, each, of most of these very quickly. You know, technology, there are some towns that from a very high, very high level, because I haven't done like in the trenches analysis for any of these towns from wireless. You know, we believe given all the benchmarks that we've seen in rural areas, that there are towns that could get 60 to 100% coverage at a 25 meg speed, just like you heard Dave talk about at Royalston uh, with wireless. For the cost, for the to the, the cost of that to them to do that would be the grant that you guys have already allocated for them. Meaning, the town wouldn't have to borrow at all to get to that point. More or less, you know, on, right? So that's that's an argument in favor of considering at least for those bottom towns that are never going to break even. At least considering relaxing the it has to be fiber it has to be um, it has to be ubiquitous conversation. Um, however. There's a good argument against it, right? And the argument against it is if one town gets wireless and they're getting 25 meg speeds and the next town gets fiber and they're getting gigabit speeds, you know, that's not gonna necessarily be perceived as fair, um, as sufficient, etc. cetera. Um, coverage, you know, uh, the way that the private sector does this, and I'm not counseling you to do what the private sector does, but the way that the private sector does, which, which MBI is, all too familiar with is they they stipulate a density level that will be covered and a distance from their plant that they will cover and outliers from that density and from that distance from the plant are left on their own left on their own doesn't necessarily mean hey sorry you know you can never have our service it means you know we'll provide the same subsidy to you that we would provide to the farthest person and you have to pay the rest Right? Decisions like that can reduce costs, reduce, reduce town debt, et cetera, at the expense of coverage. Um, another decision like that about coverage is how much do you cover, right? Do you, do you ask homeowners to pay, maybe it's in, in, an, in a bill, so it's not all at once, but to pay for their own drop. The drop is the distance from the curve to the house, so down their driveway. Or do you ask them, the way that the cable companies do it is they pay for the first X amount of feet and homeowners have to pay for anything beyond that, right? So those are ways that you can reduce costs, that towns could decide, if you allow the towns to make those decisions, that the towns could reduce costs. Um, let me just paint a real granular picture of what that means. That means that Mr. Smith, who lives on the top of the mountain, is the only person in a town who's got a half a mile long driveway and he doesn't get connected because he's not going to pay the $3,000 to get up his driveway. 
right? That's one way to think about it. The other way to think about it is everybody gets $500 of costs associated with connecting them. He, Mr. Smith gets the first $500, but he has to pay for this. So that's covered. Pricing, you have, you have room in pricing that would still, you'd still end up cheaper than satellite, than the satellite options. Um, but, again, I told you, you know, we've heard very explicitly that people want the same prices that their neighboring cable tenants have. Um, the others are, are much less uh, important. So there's a lot of questions left open. Here are questions that Wipro suggests that MBI should be thinking about, should be tackling, not suggesting that I tackle them for you. I'm just saying these are things that you need to, I think you need to think about. Um, Towns can go it alone. They can get together in small groups and collectively negotiate. Um, and there are some benefits that we have not examined, to my knowledge, that MBI does not examine around clustering towns into you know, smaller than a 44 regional solution, but some broader than a one town solution. Um, there are definitely towns, I described the two by two, that can borrow, look like they're operationally sustainable or in that upper right quadrant that could, should, probably need to get moving first so you can get some wins. There are things that you can do um, around soliciting uh, in information and requests for proposal, et cetera, to generate, to more formally generate interest from other private sector companies in Western Massachusetts. Um, towns need to, I think, we're still hearing from them that, especially the, those at the bottom, towns don't fully understand all the financial, operational, um, and legal risks that they're taking, and could use more education. Um, and I have, you know, outside of my pay grade, to how any of the decisions up and down those blue boxes around fiber versus wireless or coverage, etc., impact, uh, you know, grants from the state or not. So I think it needs to be investigated. And those are for towns for fiber. There are towns that we've heard want wireless. Same types of conversations. Um, wireless, wireless is not a uh, standard single technology. So unlike fiber, where where there's different types of fiber, but you run a fiber to a house and you serve internet over that fiber, and it can be a GPON network or an Ethernet network, but the fiber itself is fiber. There are several different wireless technologies, each of which have a different, require different equipment, offer a different basket of benefits, and have different cost structures that come with them. Um, and even if you decided to do to allow wireless in certain towns, the wireless solution between towns, even within a town, might not be the same. So you heard Dave earlier talk about Royalston in a fixed wireless project. They decided not to use TV white space. TV white space is effectively an unregistered band of uh, you know, public band of frequency. There are technologies that use TV white space. There are technologies that don't use TV white space. There are line of sight technologies where you have to have a tower that can see every house. There are wireless mesh technologies where you put lots of equipment and it all connects to itself. So there are, there are all sorts of solutions there. Um, the biggest question, in my opinion, other than the cost, I guess the second biggest question is how much ubiquity would a town lose? Like how much coverage can you actually get in a particular town? Um, and again, how does this impact the grant? And then finally, there are, there are lots of other questions like how do you finance it? What about the towns that don't know what they want to do? How do we engage with them in a more meaningful way so we can put them in any of the myriad of lists that we've created? Um, and how can we help assure towns that are most concerned with their exposure for operating losses that the next conversation we're having with them has, has addressed that? So those are things that I think you should. Uh, oh, what happened to your little thank you slide? Oh, a bunch of my slides. Okay. 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 Thank you slide disappeared. <laughs> yeah. uh, there was a thank you slide that was actually intended to be also a pause because. Uh, I don't know about you, but you just got a heck of a lot of information thrown at you, and uh, and Michael's here, and so uh, I'd love to just uh, there's another slide that talks about different things we're thinking of, but I'd love to allow the board the questions or comments and share with some wish. I open it up to board members. I'll 
I can say is yes, I think there's certainly questions here, and the questions aren't unlike some that are being asked uh, back in my office, too. And you haven't been asked for years. I mean, we've been struggling with this question of what I would have called the consistency or your ubiquity wireless for some time. And my fear has always been that wireless in really true covered country is highly erratic, so in fact you're not going to know that you can reach Mr. Smith until you actually put the damn power and put the damn on his house and it doesn't work, having had that experience personally. So there's the trouble is the trade-off here isn't an apple and orange in space. You know, wireless and it's cheaper, you don't really know what kind of ubiquity you're going to get. Or you can go for fiber to the home and make it sustainable. You don't really know what it's going to cost. And you're going to get people in there and, and, and try to propose a price to them. And then you're going to say, well, really, you know, this, this, this isn't going to cost what it costs next door. And they're going to say, why can Comcast do this? It seems to me some of these trials are really going to shed a lot of light, but I don't know whether they sort of cherry picks the region. You, you, you said something very specific. They picked sort of a bowl-shaped part of Rosalind to do this. That's not an accident, right? Because that's going you know, to give them the maximum probability to hit all the houses. And it's, yeah. it's wintertime. Yeah. And it's wintertime. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they are going to test right. in the spring with the foliage. Yeah. So they are right. plenty of different. But, you know, there's a, there's a tension here between trying to just, hey, let's get on with it and what we can learn about the wireless. But, I've never had, I've, I've, been, I've been advocating fiber, and I just want to be clear, the reason I've been advocating fiber is not because I knew that it was easy to make it economically sustainable, but because I felt the, you know, tears would follow if you put the wireless up, and they just can't hit 30% of the houses, and everybody's going to say, wait a minute, guys, I, I don't know how to do that in advance. I don't know how to solve the problem in advance. You can quantify the things. But the trouble is you're doing it apples and oranges. At least it feels to me, the towns are faced with an apples and oranges. Which kind of uncertainty do you accept? So, so you are exactly correct. So uh, no, no argument whatsoever. I'll tell you that the way that you addressed it on the fiber side is to go out and measure distances and look at cost of materials and look at construction costs and have a few now firms, including mine, give you estimates for what that construction cost would be. And that's how you dealt with the uncertainty, as you pointed out, around what's it really going to cost. On the wireless side, you have similar options. You can go out and you can physically, on the ground, examine lines of sight. You can shoot beams of light around and measure them and determine, not with any level of perfection, um, but you can determine that if uh, from 100 feet up from the top of this hill, I've got lines of sight to 683 out of 692 homes, all right? It's not perfect. When you build it, you're going to find out that, oh, you know, somebody, this tree moved, and how did the tree move? Somebody else put up a, you know, a third story on their house, and now it doesn't work. But that's around the edges. Um, so you can still get not a perfect, but a decent estimate of what the coverage is going to be, what the cost is going to be, and what the speeds are going to be. And you know, to, so I mean, that's the first answer. The second answer is, you know, is it enough? Is it good enough? Is it sufficient? Is it worth the cost, etc.? That's I mean, I, I'm I'm not going to propose a, an answer to that. There, there's you get you can get fiber. You can, let me put it that way. You can get wireless solutions at about a third of the cost of fiber, and the speeds are today over the broadband definition, but nowhere near a third of speeds that you can get on fire. Somebody asked about about you know future proof, which I don't like that word, but you know fiber is going to be able to deal with bandwidth until the fiber breaks down. Whatever bandwidth requirements, you'll put, they'll put new equipment on it and it can handle further bandwidth. That's uncertain for wireless. The wireless can handle bandwidth needs today. The pros and cons. Yeah, so I I I, uh, I appreciate this <coughs> recipe you all 
or event risk from the schedule of decisions, the 100 plus decisions that, that have an impact on outcomes. And I, I think about the role of MBI in that mix, that schedule. There are some things on that schedule that um, I think are fundamental for uh, things like sustainability. And I, I think that the state and MBI have to care about, care about. They're fundamental, they're, are we spending public dollars well? There are other choices in that mix that I am not indifferent about, but I don't think ought to be made here as a matter of policy. That would be made the way lots of municipal decisions are made, locally. Uh, town Williamstown has not ubiquitous fire hydrants. Linda, uh, in those 44 towns, I bet there are many without ubiquitous fire hydrants. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, the town of Williamstown does not have 100% coverage for public sewer, nor for public water, nor for street lights. We've made a host of those decisions over a long period of time on the musical level about how we will afford the things that we have to do. Sometimes quite grudgingly, uh, we've done only what the state or federal governments have made us do. So I think we ought to think about that schedule of choices in that, with that set of lenses. There are some that we must care about because we think they're fundamental to our stewardship role for state dollars. There are others that, frankly, um, I, think, I think those who are most directly affected ought to play a role in, and not as a matter of policy established here, but by at the municipal level. I think that, that otherwise we, we will make bad choices. I think we will make bad choices. And we will struggle with questions in the abstract, well, is that fair, i.e., I look I live on a mountaintop. Is that fair? Frankly, those those questions are have been re, have been addressed a, a thousand times across the Commonwealth, and can be addressed quite fairly again. So, uh, uh, and for me, all of the work you've done at looking at all of those, what are the consequences of those choices? I'm quite comfortable with that work. I, I want us to be informing those choices as powerfully as we can, both at this level and at the municipal level. I think we needed that kind of work to get done. I don't want them made in a vacuum. I want them made with, with, with facts that we can speak to with confidence. So I don't regard any of this, Michael, as uh, extraneous or, or, or otherwise. Let me just say this. I, uh, one, of the most, one of the most intensive local decisions, it seems to me, is the price point as it's tied to penetration. If you live in the town of Leverett, uh, Peter DeRico made it a matter of civic pride to sign up for the service. I'm sure he went out and tried to make sure everybody did. And he achieved something spectacular. I think we're going to see that relationship of price and penetration best addressed at the local level, not here. Um, we could talk about it in the abstract, the $64 point, the 75 the 85 100 etc. But I think we ought to allow those choices to be made, all with an eye to sustainability. I don't think that we should ever come up with a plan that orphans, at whatever level of penetration, 8 or 15 towns. I don't think we should orphan anybody. That can't happen. At the same time, I want to be very explicit about the risk that if we don't do it well as a policy matter, that we're engaged in, a, in the need to, uh, to recognize that we've created a recipe for failure, mm -hmm. and thus a recipe for either continuing state uh, contribution or local contribution. And we have to help define success and failure yeah. for those, some of those kinds. So, so I, I'm not sure which of those hundred belong in which bucket, but I, I do know there's a distinction in my mind about where those best ought to be made, either by the type of the decision, just the pure character of the decision, 
or the nexus at which um, the best feedback or the best intelligence about the will of the people, if you will, can, can best be determined. So that's sort of how I've been thinking about these things. I like ubiquity because it was a it was a gold standard. I always liked it because I wanted to know what that might mean. And if I didn't say that, I would never get a chance to ask them or answer those questions with any kind of intelligence. I knew if I thought about 60%, I'd get a different answer than 100%. So you know, those that's the way I've thought about these. But there are others that I feel absolutely very quite strongly about we have to make yeah, as I stewards think, of public I guess money. my question following up on that is just what is the process of constant evaluation? So if what we're saying is there are a lot of variables here, there's maybe even new technology options that are going to continue to be options. You know, how are we constantly evaluating the options town by town, region by region, cluster by cluster, proposal by proposal? I think that's the challenge. And I don't have an answer, but as I hear all of this, that's my concern, that we don't have uh, a way to do that that, I don't know. Well, I got to tell you this. I don't think there are unlimited options. That's the first thing. In other words, this is not this is not me in, in the uh, grocery aisle looking at the pickle <coughs> shelf. You know, there are endless varieties. I don't think that's true. Let's so, from Karen and then David. So I have a quick question for Michael. So Michael, first of all, thank you for that presentation. And Eric, thank you so much for pushing the discussion in that direction in terms of looking at what we've approved in the past. But what I'm not hearing is, like, what are other states doing? What are other cities doing? So I know our topography is interesting, the western part of the state, but we can't be the only state with the type of topography that we have. Um, looking at this issue, there must be other communities around the country that are dealing with this and maybe sort of coming up with some solutions. That's one question, but also to piggyback on something Katie said in terms of advancing technology. We have some pretty smart people around this table. I'm sitting next to Microsoft. There's MIT across the table from us, for me. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe you can tell us some secrets for us. <laughs> but my point is, what's, what's on the horizon that, you know, maybe we can be hopeful for and can, can apply to um, this problem? So again, what's going on around the country and then what can we look for? So, so I'm I'm always the one uh, banging the drum for faster action, and what I'm going to tell you is on the other side of that. Massachusetts is actually very much uh, in the pole position um, for dealing with this issue in the country. There's a there's a pilot project going on in Connecticut. We went down and met with them, and there's a lot of. Um, there's a lot of press with much less um, much less staff kind of moving to the press rooms and everything. And I say that there's two full-time staffers in what they would call their MBI. They're trying to figure out where to move those staffers and how to build a team underneath them. And they're looking at MBI as an example. Um, that and, and I say that they're far ahead of us in the press. If you look at everything that, that and we've had a lot of press lately, mm -hmm. but um, so that's just you know one, one versus another. Um, there are projects in um, New York. There are projects in uh, the western part of this of the country that are kind of in the infancy. Um, a lot of them. There are a lot of town by town projects that look like Royal City. Right. <clears throat> to, to my knowledge, there are no. Not anymore. There were for a little while, but not anymore. There are no substantive town financed fiber builds where a town decides we don't have internet we're going to go build a fiber network after we build it or while we're building it we're going to go figure out who's going to operate it that happened for a little while um, about 10 years ago eight, 10 years ago it's not happening anymore for all of these operating for all of these operating issues um, so that so massachusetts is ahead i mean not far far ahead but 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 ahead um, your second series of questions was about what technologies are coming. So there are, you know, when people think about wireless, at least when I think about wireless, I think about, you know, universities, 
towns and cities that are kind of dense and urban that have wireless um, broadcasting nodes and are covering a, a very homogeneous small topography. Right? That's wireless from eight years ago. Um, there are now a lot of projects that involve putting an antenna on top of putting a, you know, receivers at locations, getting line of sight, figuring out how to, how to serve like that. Um, and as you go farther off, this is very fanciful, right? But Google is experimenting, among others, with wireless from hot air balloons that you tether and put up so that you don't need a tower. The technology of that is very similar to the technologies that you would put on a tower. If you had a tower, you wouldn't use a hot air balloon. If you're willing to build a tower, you wouldn't use a hot air balloon. Um, and every year, or every two years or so, the amount of throughput that, that we're pushing into wireless is improving, just like it is in fiber. Right? And I won't say that wireless is unlimited. And like Fiber is going to be limited by the speed of light. Wireless is not going to be limited in the same way. Wireless is going to be limited more than fiber. But, but how far from now, I mean, we have no idea. Yes, I was I was just going to say a quick follow up to what Don said, and I'll very quickly answer this, this question about technology. But I won't take all your time. Some of the questions that we're talking about here are going to turn out to be <coughs> particularly significant in turning the sustainability off, and I think your talk pulls these out, some of these things out. But I think it might be good to explicitly go in and pull them out and say which of all of those other decisions when you turn that knob does it actually swing the sustainability meter wildly because and I, as I say it's, it's in there but I think it would be good to really focus on those questions because that's where we have to bring the attention it turns out if all those decisions belong to the towns like I think I agree with you the pricing decision we've we've learned something and that's very important yeah. let me say something just very quickly about wireless when you talk about 25 down and 10 up, say, the thing you have to understand is that every tower has a certain amount of RF spectrum. And every year, people get a little better at squeezing a few more bits through the RF spectrum. But you're never going to squeeze a factor of 10 through there. It just doesn't work out that way. You can say, well, I've divided up into sectors. These are sort of linear responses. If you talk to people that are trying to do wireless, and they're trying to respond to the fact that the demand for wireless seems to be growing exponentially, and that's more about mobile wireless than fixed. There's only one response that scales, and that's to put up more towers. And in the limit, the wireless system is a wireline system, because you've got so many tires out there, you have to do is build fiber to the curb. And, and that's really the only way you're going to scale the system up. And somebody can say, I want 25 megabits down, but there's another question, which is, and how many, how many gigabytes a month are they downloading? And if they're watching, Netflix 24 hours a day, they're only using five megabits down, but they're sucking capacity out of that tower to tremendous rate. So there are a bunch of other parameters here about, well, are we really going to expect all of these people to watch YouTube 24 hours a day at five megabits down? That's going to exhaust the total capacity of the tower. And there's an engineering issue here, which again does not come up in it does not come up in fiber. People are going to have to understand a lot more about the subtlety of capacity management and just how many towers you're willing to put up. And at the limit, you've built a wireline system to get enough towers out there for the system. And that's the direction, that's the, direction the commercial wireless guys are going. Okay. I'll, just, I'll just offer kind of the, the economics under, under that. The, the types of technologies that, that Professor Clark is talking about that really are going to take the bandwidth really, really, truly, I know it sounds crazy, involve Netflix and streaming of very high definition video and five years streaming 4K video. It's going to suck a lot of bandwidth out of the system. To the order of, at peak time, Netflix uses more than 60% of an all available internet capacity. Right? I mean, like, that's, at peak time, that's crazy, right? In normal times, Netflix uses like 20 to 30 percent. I mean, for a single application. So you could say, and I'm not saying you should say this, and I would be very sad if I lived in Massachusetts if you said this, but you could say you can't have 4K on Netflix, right, as a way, or at least you can't yet until we can solve this issue. You can have everything else that the internet offers except that, right? If you want that, then we gotta bring fiber to the home, and it's gonna cost everybody $2,000, you know, every homeowner $2,000 to pay for 4K Netflix, 
<coughs> and that's the that's the decision that that we're weighing here, or that we're weighing on behalf of homeowners, just for context. That does translate into terms that the consumer will understand. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Absolutely. My eight and eleven-year-old daughters uh, would be livid with me if I told them they had to manage the amount of time they spend on YouTube and Netflix and Amazon Fire and Google and everything else that they're downloading into our house. I can't get on my own laptop because my children are sucking up all the bandwidth of our Comcast. So. Anyway, so I just want to echo something that Don said that just really resonates with me, which is we're talking about 44 towns. There is, is clearly not one size fits all. There isn't a perfect solution. That is 27,000 households, right? 27,000. It's also important. <coughs> 27,000 households. But I think that there isn't, it's become clear that when we started down this road, we wanted fiber to the home for everybody in every one of these communities. And now that we've crunched the numbers, it's clear that to have a sustainable network for every town is going to be a challenge. But that said, we ought to be able to come up with some solution for every town. And I, I would hate to leave towns by the wayside because they can't do debt service or because um, they can't afford fiber to the premise or whatever it is, there has to be something we can do for all 44 towns and not leave some behind because they're at the bottom of Michael's scale. This, this, is, this is, by the way, a really, uh, really great from the board's perspective and engagement around this topic today because this is exactly the conversation I wanted to have and kick off all the things you brought up, that there are towns that are very challenged from an operating perspective, particularly at the extremes. But we're also not, where we've been asked to look at wireless, or we're looking at wireless, it's not because, you know, we've, we've changed our minds, so to speak, and think it's ID, the ideal technology for customers. It's because, one, we're being asked to towns that, we're, that our current policy, which was incented towards challenging towns to see if they would be willing to step up um, to engage in investments in the fiber of the home that was ubiquitous. And that was the, the intent was clearly in that direction. There's no question about that. Um, but we've also been challenged by not only our analysis, but also individual towns that have come to us and said, your policy is kind of a blunt instrument. If we, if, if we really can't afford this or we're concerned about sustainability, what, how do we wrestle with questions around state support? How do we wrestle with our alternatives when, when we recognize that in our town the alternative might be uh, a suboptimal bandwidth of it over time in terms of the quality of service that we get as residents, it may be 70% coverage in the town as opposed to 100% coverage, but at least up until this point, it seemed that MBI was saying you either could borrow a heck of a lot of money and build out fiber to the home with questionable economics, or, or you have nothing, right? I mean, so the question ends up being on the margins. How do you deal with that? And I think the other point that was made, which I really appreciate, was, was getting into a, a discussion of what specific levers affect sustainability for individual towns. How do we look at that, not in a conceptual way, which to some extent is good as this has been, we've, we're still a bit of a conceptual lens. I mean, I know that the spreadsheet you put together has lots of real costs and real things in it, and that's, that's terrific. But I think when we're, when we're going forward, what we need to be able to do, and this is something you said, Don, is, is uh, offer towns and offer the general body politic, including the state, some, uh, the administration, I should say, because we're part of the state, uh, some comfort around how towns are looking through alternatives and sustainability. So on pricing, I'm not, I don't think we would be saying what the pricing should be. I think it's, it's clearly, though, a variable, right? And I wouldn't want to be hamstrung of the notion that if you're at $65 pricing, oh, you don't work, whatever that means. But at $75 or $80, you do. Well, that's a town conversation for the town to have about what the trade-offs are between the, the uh, take rate and the pricing and how you're dealing with long-term issues around capital replacement, replenishment, things like that. The point I'm making is, is that I think what we're going to do here, and I'm sort of hinting at it in the next slide, and this isn't definitive. These are just things that are essentially suggestive of, of ways in which MBI can dig in 
much more deeply in support attempts, uh, including trying to understand and engage um, what the options are for the private sector to engage as potential <coughs> providers. Um, as we said earlier, that's not biasing any conversations with individuals, individual towns or MLPs, because we, as we pointed, we have a bunch of towns that are looking to operate on their own are going to want that guidance irrespective of what happens um, with Wired West. Um, we also have we also had this question around wireless and feasibility, which I think uh, Professor Clark did a perfect job of articulating. That's an un, that's not a butcher it. It is a complicated question, not an uncomplicated question, uh, in, in that there are a range of variables in there that have to be evaluated well in order to support the sounds. And, and, I, and I'm hoping that in addition to and digging into issues of um, uh, intermunicipal agreements and how that kind of procurement can be done, that we're also able to really provide deeper guidance around sustainability that, again, is putting, I think, the directional arrow right uh, in terms of things that are really in the power uh, of the towns to decide, but also, frankly, some things that are variables that are in the power of the consumer, right? Like whatever the town set up, ultimately people are going to sign up <coughs> as consumers in the marketplace, and that's going to affect outcomes. And I, I think for us, when we're thinking about sustainability, we're thinking about a range of potential scenarios and understanding the risks and trade-offs with those scenarios so we can get a good handle on sustainability. Not necessarily that MBI or Mass Tech has an interest in dictating those outcomes per se on sustainability. But we need to have comfort around sustainability. So these are just a couple different thoughts. I don't know if people have any well, thoughts just, on that. So I think, Eric, what I want to understand clearly, though, because we're, uh, we are running short on time, too, is so between now and the next meeting, um, what do you anticipate doing so that at the next meeting, what should we anticipate needing to wrestle with or be discussing because I'm just trying to so those are possible next steps but that's a little ambiguous I mean so between now and then as you talk about these things you know do you have a sense of how you're going to start to wrestle with these things or yeah I mean I think on the uh uh, yeah, yeah. Or Don, do you have a suggestion? I well, I, in your mouth. I, 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 I could tell you this. I just want our board Sam, to be very clear about oh, this was a great presentation. Yeah. We could just per, to could discuss it. Today. Yeah. What's happening no, next I, meeting? What happens? I, I think I think that uh, list of 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 a hundred decisions ought to be examined, and uh, we, we ought to comb that for what's the appropriate locus for specific, you know, town mm -hmm. granularity decision making are some decisions, and I think yeah. there are, should they be made here, and then we ought to make that that division or that distinction quite clear. Right. That's a and we are also on the state side, you know, we've been working with uh, Eric and DOR and ANF, also scrubbing the state's numbers of course. around what does the state perceive a community's financial ability. Yeah, so we've got, and, and so we will share that. Yeah, and I think mm -hmm. that's pretty clear. So for me, the last question that, that Michael had on the, you know, what should be a precondition for grant funding, et cetera. Yep. For me, it, it should be about a, a notion of success. A notion of success for me is about sustainability. And so I'm, I'm, I never meant for fiber to the home be to be a straight jet that would constrain and yeah. destroy. I, 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 if, if that was taken from our prior actions, I'm surprised at that. For me, it's not a straight jet. So I think we ought to refine that list and think and have recommendations from staff about okay. what bucket those decisions ought, ought to be placed in and why. Okay. And then how are we prepared to help the towns wrestle with the consequences of the decisions in those buckets, et cetera. And so okay. I think having that flushed out, I think, I think Michael's presentation sets that up nicely. Okay. It asks a ton of questions. I think we ought to start to answer some. And, okay. I, and, and Don, I think yeah. on, on, no, I think that makes sense to me. I think on that, I mean, if the first step is having the right frame in terms of these. I know Troy has made up numbers. It's a nice, another nice round number, <laughs> but hundred levers, whether it's eighty or ninety yeah, or hundred percent. Yeah. Um, that, that's uh, having that. I I also I I just have a sense that uh, again, if we take a pose that's not directive, but rather informative, um, I think MBI probably needs to dig deeper in laying out what our understanding is of, of uh, uh, 
the circumstances of different towns and what the levers are, not in a direct way, but literally almost like a tool to help towns look at their own, look at, at their individual or collectively mm -hmm. a number of towns, looking at if they make certain decisions, what follows. Okay. You know, anyways. Okay, and I want to give Linda the sure, last word. Sure, Well, you know, if, if I brought this up over the years and we stopped thinking about wireless for a while, but we have a fairly extensive tower system in Western Mass that is our emergency communication system. In Franklin County, we have 15 towers, 16 now towers that we're using for emergency communication. About a third owned by my organization, about a third privately owned, and about a third owned by the Department of Conservation and Recreation and used jointly by the region and the state police. And over the years, we've talked about and have never figured out how can we use those towers if wireless is a possibility? Because the, the conflict you have is that public safety will say, we cannot tamper with emergency communication. And we can't. And, there, and yet, there must be a way to use these towers for both purposes. One challenge, Katie, that you should know about is DCR is not a good sharer. <laughs> and, they, yeah. and, and they are our tallest towers, mm -hmm. and, and, and getting them to play with us has been very difficult for okay. emergency communication, but also for broadband expansion. Okay. So if we think wireless is going to be seriously looked at, figuring out how to share mm -hmm. the towers with public safety is a huge issue that we should finally resolve. Yeah. Katie, one yeah. thing I'd like to suggest as a next step for the next board meeting is having MBI, and I'd love it to be with you and Percog and others. I love Professor Clark's example, but at least now you're able to. I think we need to frame out what um, some significant engagement around wireless would look like. And I'm saying that in a vague way only because I think it touches all these different elements. Other assets we're unaware of that we should be leveraging. Yeah. What are the different decision points or implications we have? Who wants a hot wireless. air balloon floating over their town? It, Exactly. Or I or know. Uh, and, but we we owe that back to you because yeah. you know as we've uh, we honestly said we've been dealing with wireless essentially on an ad hoc basis based on towns raising their hand and say you know give us help and that's been fine to a point but we can actually get more economies frankly out of our out of our resources if we do it more systematically anyway and I think the questions that are coming up around what are other states or geographies doing what are the variety of technologies and then what does it mean for a given town. Um, are, are important enough and are going to be asked by enough different venues and different places that we need to organize ourselves to address it. Okay. All right. Very good. I think it's good. That gives us enough to, enough on the platter for next time. You yeah. guys have enough. Okay. Right. All right. All right. So I know that there's, and thank you, Michael. Um, there's, I think number four is the last mile initiative discussion. We haven't even gotten there, right? I think we just had it. Yeah, was that number four? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm just making sure. Months. I wasn't yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. That was still I apologize. Number four. Yes, okay. that was number four. Okay, so then, so then, with half hour left, we are in number five. Okay, so um, number five, we are going to be going to make the motion to go into executive session. Correct. Um, so uh, we will now propose to go into executive session in order to discuss strategy with respect to the matter referenced by Mass Tech General Counsel. Purpose for meeting in executive session is to discuss the case. Uh, is that discussion of Mass Tech strategy with respect to this matter in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of Mass Tech? Would you accept a question from before, Madam Chair? Yes. For that? Yes, <laughs> I will. Okay. As long as in the interest of time, we realize no, that it's it, short. It should be pretty quick and simple. Where can I get minutes of your meetings? Can I get that slideshow presentation that's presented today? Our town is very concerned about the cost. Yeah. We have trouble buying toilet paper. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. we I heard sp spoken today was that Mount Washington did not want part of the $40 million. Will their portion of it be split amongst the towns that are in there? And what is the status of that $40 million? We, see that Leverett got a chunk of change more than what was originally specified mm. and I don't know where that money came from okay so and I haven't been able to get the question today so, so let's so okay so I'm gonna say for meeting minutes and presentation etc 
Eric and his staff can certainly right? yeah. direct that to you guys. Sure. Um, on the other questions, what I'd like to do is let those stand as questions that we are going to incorporate. They are, they are part of this fuller discussion that we're having and that um, I'm going to put that in the bucket of this is what we're going to be working with between now and then and, sure. and discussion and we don't have, there, there's not an answer I can give you immediately, but that it's a good question. We're concerned that the money yes. is not, not going to be there for it's us. A, it's a we're very, it's a, it's, well. We're concerned. We're really concerned about it. What I'm going to say is we are going to be working to make sure that concerns that get raised, and you can always email further questions and concerns anytime, um, to make sure, I mean, literally, I hope the, the, the pipeline and communication is open, um, so that we're making sure that we're giving you guys a level of comfort and, and uh, answers back. And accountability. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Just quickly, thank you. what is the answer to getting a copy of this of the PowerPoint? That's we just all. yes or no? Can like we get it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's a public. Yeah. It's a public public, meeting, public document. Sure. Yeah. Of course. So, well, what? I was just gonna. There, there was one more question. I'm just gonna be respectful of the folks that we have in the room. I know you've come a long way to be here. So, one more quick question. Thank you. Um, dealt a lot with the hard towns. We have two towns, Hardwick and Montague, which are actually quite easy. And uh, we think we have a terrific economical, sustainable solution. How do we get some urgency into that? Okay, so that's a good question. And actually, I'll, I'll answer that really quickly, which is um, Eric has been communicating with me the communities that feel some urgency and, and want to move forward. When I mentioned at the beginning of my comments that the administration has asked us to pause um, because a town's urgency and even MBI's agreement with urgency does not translate necessarily. So dry in here. Does not translate necessarily into A and F and DORs automatic. Okay, that sounds great. Let's go. So they have asked to ask us to pause a little bit so they can better understand um, the towns. You know what you guys are doing, the business plans around what you guys want to implement because they don't they don't want to release funds until they feel 100% sure as you do. Um, that it's ready. So if I'm not talking about you know a year. I'm talking about a brief pause so that we can have um, the same agreement on the state side. I can you define brief? Um, I wish I could. I mean, I don't. You know, these are these are ongoing meetings that we're having diligently, um, and I would you know hope. You know, I don't. I, I don't want to define it because I don't know how in the weeds the conversation could get between all of us. I, I am anticipating being able to go out and visit with MBI a lot of the different towns myself and convey some of the concerns, expectations, and thoughts that are, that are coming from the administration. So the best I can do. But um, I will make a commitment to make sure that there is open dialogue around that, that you know, timing, et cetera, as we move forward. So OK? All right. So get a motion to go into executive session. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Bill?